How does a boy raised in the moving trucks of the Indian Army grow up to make a $34 billion bet that changed tech history? You are looking at the man currently running one of America's oldest giants, Arvind Krishna, the CEO of IBM. But he didn't get there through sales or marketing. He isn't a flashy Silicon Valley founder. He is a scientist who spent 18 years in a lab who had to cross an ocean to prove that code is the ultimate universal language. In the next few minutes, we are going to deconstruct his life to answer three questions. How did the rigorous, pressure cooker, education system of India forge his leadership style? Why did he stake the future of a legacy company on a massive acquisition that critics hated? And finally, what does it actually take to wake a sleeping giant? We're going to look at how he forced a company famous for its past to finally face its future. Just a quick reminder, if you appreciate this in-depth content, please take a moment to like and subscribe. It helps us bring you more. Now, on with the story. Krishna was born in 1962 in Andhra Pradesh, but he didn't grow up in a town. He grew up in the Indian Army. His father, Major General Vinod Krishna, moved the family constantly. From Kunur to Dehradun, Arvind was perpetually the new kid. This wasn't just travel. It was a masterclass in adaptability. While his father instilled military discipline, his mother, Arathi Krishna taught him compassion through her work with army widows. This duality, structure, and empathy became the foundation of his leadership. But before he could lead, he had to survive the pressure cooker. By 1980, Krishna set his sights on engineering. He applied to the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, better known as IIT. Now, let's pause. If you are from the West, you might think of this as just another college. You would be wrong. Let's look at the data. In the United States, the acceptance rate for Harvard or MIT typically hovers around 4 or 5 percent. That is incredibly exclusive. But IIT? The acceptance rate is often less than 1 percent. For every single seat in that classroom, there are literally hundreds of thousands of students competing in what is arguably the most difficult entrance exam on earth, the JEE. -E. It is a filter designed to produce the absolute best. And Krishna didn't just survive it. He thrived there. He studied electrical engineering, honing a technical mind that was as rigorous as it was creative. He graduated in 1985 but he realized something important. To push the boundaries of what was possible in computer engineering, he couldn't stay where he was. He needed to go where the research was happening. He needed to go to America. This brings us to the most critical transition of his life. In 1985, he enrolls at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign for his PhD on an F1 visa. Imagine the cultural whiplash. He went from the chaotic, vibrant density of India to the quiet, flat plains of the American Midwest. But here we need to pause the biography to look at the mechanism that makes this story possible. It isn't just about brain power. It is about the legal right to be in the room. Krishna joined IBM in 1990. For high-skilled professionals, this transition is almost always bridged by one specific tool the H-1B visa. This pathway allows American companies to employ foreign workers in specialty occupations. But it is precarious. Your right to live in the country is tied directly to your employment. You lose the job, you lose your home. Yet, for Krishna, this legal framework provided a vital platform. It gave him the stability to stop worrying about his visa status and start thinking about the next decade of technology. He has since become a vocal advocate for this system, arguing that you cannot develop the best technology if you block the flow of the best people. The visa wasn't just a stamp. It was the key that unlocked his potential 
to contribute to the American economy. With his status secured, Krishna didn't immediately jump into management. He didn't try to become a CEO. He went to work. He joined IBM's famous Thomas J. Watson Research Center, and he stayed there for 18 years. This is the part of the story we want to emphasize because it completely contradicts the modern narrative of the overnight success. Arvind Krishna spent nearly two decades as a scientist. He wasn't chasing stock options. He was chasing breakthroughs. This is rare today. Everyone wants to be a CEO by 25. Be honest. Would you have the patience to stay in the same job for 18 years if you knew it would pay off in the end? Let us know in the comments. During this time, he co-authored 15 patents. He worked on wireless networking, security, systems, and databases. He helped create the world's first commercial wireless system. He was deep in the weeds of the technology that runs our world. Wired Magazine even later called him one of 25 geniuses who are creating the future of business, specifically for his foundational work on blockchain. This era was his turning point. It was where he built the credibility that no amount of business school marketing can buy. He understood the products because he had built them. But great technology alone wasn't enough to save IBM. By 2009, he moved into executive leadership, and he saw the writing on the wall. IBM was missing the cloud revolution. It was becoming a relic. Quick question. IBM is iconic, but everyone's entry point is different. What was the first computer you ever owned? Was it an IBM, a Mac, or something else? Drop the brand name in the comments. This leads us to the most audacious maneuver of his career. By 2018, Krishna was the senior vice president of cloud. He had a radical thesis. He approached the CEO at the time, Guinea Rometty, with a proposal that would shake the industry. He wanted to acquire Red Hat, the world's leading provider of open source enterprise software. The price tag? $34 billion. It was the largest acquisition in the history of the company. It was a massive allocation of capital that drew immediate scrutiny from the press and Wall Street. But Krishna was the principal architect of this deal. He argued that this was the only way to position IBM as a leader in the hybrid cloud market. He saw that the future wasn't just one giant public cloud, but a complex web of systems private servers, public clouds that needed to talk to each other. Red Hat was the translator. This wasn't just a business deal. It was a shift in philosophy. It was the immigrant scientist telling the century-old American corporation that it had to change its DNA to survive. The strategy proved correct. The acquisition closed in July 2019 and it fundamentally altered the trajectory of the company. It didn't just add revenue, it revitalized the culture, and the board noticed. In January 2020, the board made it official. Arvind Krishna would take the reins as CEO, but the trust in him didn't stop there. Just one year later, he was elected chairman of the board, consolidating his leadership over the company's future. Since taking the chair, the mission has been to pivot the entire ship. The focus is now aggressively on hybrid cloud and artificial intelligence with a massive long-term bet on quantum computing. With this role, Krishna also entered a very exclusive room. He stands alongside Satya Nadella at Microsoft and Sundar Pichai at Alphabet, cementing a golden era of Indian American leadership in big tech. Today, Arvind Krishna is a naturalized U.S. citizen living in Connecticut with his wife and two children. His integration into the fabric of this country goes far beyond a passport. 
He currently sits on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Think about that. The boy raised in the army barracks is now helping to steer the economic stability of the United States. But he hasn't forgotten where he came from. During the devastating COVID-19 crisis, he led a massive global effort to send medical support back to India. This dual identity is the culmination of his story. It proves that innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens when you take a disciplined mind and give it the legal stability to plant roots. Arvind Krishna showed us that sometimes the person best suited to save an American icon is someone who traveled halfway across the world to become one. The story you've just seen is a powerful answer to the question, what drives someone to leave everything behind and reshape the world with their vision? This series, proudly presented by the law offices of Chris M. Ingram, celebrates the courage, innovation, and determination of immigrants who transform history. Subscribe and join us as we continue to honor the enduring impact of immigrant ambition.